Um, I'm Lindy, I'm the policy director here at the East Bay Leadership Council. This is the Opportunity Task Force where we generally talk about issues related to health, talent and education development, economic development, all things that have to do with opportunity and creating opportunity here in the East Bay. Um, and this is a meeting about early childhood education and we have some incredible folks here to talk to us and hopefully lead us through a discussion about kind of how we can be better advocates, but also what's been going on because there's been a lot of money talked about in the early childhood education space. Um, and also a lot of lack of funding talked about in the early childhood education space and um, I think it'll be great to get a sense of where do we think there's a lot of great progress that we can build on and where do we have a lot of work left to be done. Um, I appreciate those of you who are here joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves first, so I'll call on them, the three of them, and then I'll have everyone else introduce themselves as well. Some of you that are here are part of our planning team for the Opportunity Task Force, including Dr. Sheila Hassel Hughes, who is also being honored at our installation dinner that is coming up next month. So I'm also going to drop in the chat in some information about our installation dinner because we're excited about that and we're promoting it uh, throughout this month. So. Okay, Dr. Krina Loza, would you kind of start us off with introductions? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Karina Loza. I'm a early care and education services supervisor here at Contra Costa County Office of Education. Very long title. Um, I'm responsible for overseeing uh, four different grants that we have. And um, I've been in the field of early childhood for over 10 years. I come from LA County Office of Education. That's where I worked with their Head Start and Early Learning Division. So um, have some county experience there. So I'm actually new to um, East Bay. I'm new to the Bay Area. I come from Southern California. So um, I'm learning everything as I go, but I'm very excited and um, loving everything I'm doing. So my heart is in early childhood education. So I'm doing great. So I'll pass it on over to Dr. Ruth Fernandez. Thank you, Dr. Losa. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ruth Fernandez, Executive Director with First Five Contra Costa. And I have been with First Five now for four years. Um, and prior to that, uh, was at the Contra Costa County Office of Education um, for over 13 years and um, have a long history in early childhood, um, like Karina. Um, I think education and um, early childhood have been my passion for a long time. I've been in the field for over 20 years and um, for many personal reasons as well uh, as an immigrant to the United States, um, this is very close and near dear to my heart um, to be an advocate uh, and an, a door opener for others, especially marginalized communities in education um, because knowledge is power. And so that's a little bit about me and just very pleased to be here. I'll, I guess, Lindy, we're, is it okay that we're passing it to each other or do you wanna? Absolutely, no, this is great, 100%. <laughs> okay, well then I will then pass it to Monica De Vera. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Um, my name is Monica De Vera and I am with Community Services uh, with Contra Costa County. And we administer um, our Head Start and Early Head Start programs. I've been, um, I'm the professional development analyst here and I oversee our professional development initiatives, um, focusing on um, teachers and our teacher assistants, uh, career advancement, and also our uh, trauma-informed systems, staff wellness, and our staff recruitment efforts. And um, while I've only been in this role for about three to four years now, I am very passionate about um, the community. Um, I've done a lot of volunteer work in the past and just really believe that families are the core of our, of our, our communities and just love working um, with families. And um, so Let's see, who am I passing on to next? You know what, I'll take over, Monica, how's that? Those <laughs> Thank are our three you. panelists. Thank you, um, all three of you, for being here. Uh, there's a lot of expertise here in the room, and, and I appreciate that all of you have worked in some capacity here in Contra Costa County, but also a little more broadly, because I appreciate that a lot of what we're going to be talking about today are not Contra Costa specific 
issues and are certainly things that you know the state is looking at and trying to tackle and that as we talk about advocacy there will likely be a statewide lens um nick morgan i'm going to call on you next would you mind introducing yourself nick sure um i'm nick morgan i work for the contra costa county office of education i'm in the college and career readiness department that oversees rop programs in our uh, county high schools thanks nick devorah levine Hi everyone, Devor Levine. I'm the uh, executive director of the Lesher Foundation. I've been there about a year and a half and uh, soon to be a new board member of the East Bay Leadership Council. So I'm really glad to be here and care deeply about early childhood and looking forward to listening and learning with you. Thank you for being here, Devor. Uh, Dr. Sheila Hassel Hughes. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. Good to see your faces. I'm Sheila Hassel Hughes. I'm the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts at St. Mary's College. So other end of the educational spectrum um, and um, a member of the planning team for this task force. So super excited to hear this conversation. I did invite a number of my colleagues from the Kalmanovitz School of Education at St. Mary's. Um, but again, we got a lot of things going on and people traveling and whatnot. So I don't think any of them are going to be able to attend today. Um, but I'm certainly um, excited to share out what I hear um, with them. So thanks. Thanks, Sheila. And we'll definitely have this recording available for folks to share. If there is a, some nuggets of information, you can even say like, hey, be sure to listen to minute 25 through 27. It's always kind of helpful. OK, Cindy Hatton. Hi, I'm Cindy Hatton. I'm president and CEO of Hospice of the East Bay, and I'm also a on the planning team for this uh, task force, and I represent Caltip. Thank you, Cindy. Pete Caldwell, it's so wonderful to see you and have you here. See you. Uh, yeah, Pete Caldwell, Executive Director, We Care Services for Children, which focuses on zero to five and mental health and developmental. And I'm on the exec committee of the Human Services Alliance. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. And Bill Bankhead, nice to see you, Bill. Hi. Good morning. Good to see you too again, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Bankhead. I'm the Workforce and Economic Development Manager at Los Madonos College out in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm here uh, kind of representing our early childhood education and child development program. Thank you, Bill. And then Rebecca Rosen. Nice to see you. Hi, Lindy. It's nice to see you, too. Um, I'm Rebecca Rosen. I'm with the Hospital Council, and I'm been involved in this task force for a while, um, especially when it was used to be the health task force. <laughs> and um, also on the member, a board member of EBLC. Absolutely, thank you. And then Nicole, I know you mentioned that your broadband's a little off, but did you want to introduce yourself? Sure, hi, I'm Nicole Carranza. I work with Marathon Renewable Fuels and Martinez as the Community Investments Manager, and also uh, recently joined the board of the East Bay Leadership Council. Thank you, Nicole. And it's really kind of fun to have some of our newest board members here and kind of joining us for this meeting. So exciting. And again, I have to say it, we're doing our installation dinner in August. So if you can come and welcome in this new board with us, that would be wonderful. It'd be very appreciated. Okay, I think we're going to jump into some questions. And again, we have these three wonderful panelists here to kind of talk us through and, and discuss with us. But I do want to welcome everyone to ask questions. And because we are a smaller group, we kind of have that flexibility, which I think is really great. So if you want to raise your hand throughout this process and, and jump in, I encourage you to do so. I did send some of these questions in advance to some of our panelists. So we're going to start with some of those because I think that that's an easier way to ease into it. But if you do come up with questions or you want to jump in, we, we'd encourage that. Um, I hope my panelists are OK with that as well. Uh, but we wanted to start off, I think, just talking about if there is um, something positive and just reflecting that there's been a lot of conversation about early childhood over the last two years, not always for the easiest reason. Um, but I'm curious to hear, do you feel like there's been new conversations about the young child, about child care, or any kind of positive shift in this space um, that you can share with the group? And I'm happy to let you guys kind of jump between each other, but I know sometimes it's easier to just call on someone. So Dr. Finaliza, I'm gonna kind of start with you if that's okay. Um, and then maybe we can kind of just transition between each other. Sure, that's great. Um, I think part of the positive is, you know, you know how they mentioned um, uh, any news is good news, even if it's bad news. Like um, I think having this conversation now and the fact that attention is being brought to this issue 
And it's something that, um, you know, the pan our panelists here and everybody, we've, we've, we've lived this for years, you know, in our careers and, and in our field. And we've always been advocates, but now I'm, I'm very glad that it's becoming part of what I would call the current social media platform, the current, um, you know, bringing in that youth, bringing in that younger audience to let them know about what's going on, what we need, um, bringing attention to the fact that this workforce has been in need for many years, but we are finally paying attention to them. That this has been in need for many years, but we are finally um, starting to move. To me, it feels like we're starting to move in the right direction and we're starting to move in that right direction with funding coming in. Um, you know, we've always had funding. Early childhood education has been in the conversation, but now it's coming into that popular culture, into our current um, younger population, social media. I think that's what's helping. That's the positive to me, you know, that we need to have those conversations and we need to be um, in the news. We need to be out there to, to push our agendas and to make sure that, you know, we can have universal care. That's what we need for everybody. And I think with the pandemic, that's what it has also brought to the attention. You know, that was, it's negative because we didn't want to go through the pandemic. It's something, you know, we lived through, uh, we're still going through it. But at the same time, um, I'm grateful that uh, this surge and this attention has come from it, you know. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with, with that. Monica or Ruth, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Oh, go Were ahead. You go, Monica? Oh, okay, sure. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to add uh, from my lens and what I've seen um, among our staff is um, the positive shift in, <coughs> I think in mindset, uh, because I think maybe um, from a broader perspective or general outlook of, of the ECE field is that, um, you know, we're, we're just doing this. It's this, they, they tend to um, have, that, have that thinking of we're just, we're just taking care of someone's child. But really, it's so much more than that. And, and you know, during the pandemic, we, we remained open and we provided uh, services for for the essential workers who, so our staff were also essential workers. And I saw um, like an increase in morale in, 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 and strengthening the belief that, you know, our, our ECE educators are just as important and are just as needed as doctors and nurses. And, and I saw that, and even among our teacher assistants that, we are important and we are special. And so to hear that was very uplifting. And um, we did experience challenges in a lot of our recruitment efforts, of course, but, but that really helped us um, continue to advocate for, for all our initiatives. And to build on what um, Karina and Monica said, I, I completely agree. You know, after decades of, you know, working on documenting brain research and brain development, um, we're, we're in a moment, I, I feel that that's the positive, that there's definitely, we don't need to worry about demonstrating the value of the early years because there's like just so much research to build on and um, not only in, in an ac academy, uh, you know, in academic sectors, but in education, uh, but also there's been substantial human capital, economic benefit documented through um, James Hexman's work, et cetera. So I think that what's been, um, in, in addition to what Karina and Monica mentioned at a national level, the moment that I see us leaving right now, it's that for the first time, you know, we're hearing childcare being mentioned as part of the nation's infrastructure. Um, you know, Biden's administration and, and, and their allies have been pushing this notion of caring for children, caring for, for the elderly. Um, 
as something that is incredibly crucial for our society, for a functioning economy, uh, just as crucial as building roads and bu buildings. And, and so it's human infrastructure. And I think that, that that narrative shift is definitely bringing a culture shift. Um, while you know the proposed Build Back Better bill in March 22nd didn't pass, um, you know, as, as both Karina and Monica mentioned, it's, it's front and center. And I think the pandemic um, had a lot to do with it. You know, years ago, um, uh, there was, I don't know if you heard about a day without childcare, there was a campaign called that. Well, guess what? We're kind of living in that moment because of the pandemic. Uh, families are finding themselves living in that moment of like, we were creating videos of like, what would it look like if you had to go to work and all there was no childcare in the world. And I, there were a couple of videos that a few childcare advocates created. And so I think that the chaos that the pandemic has brought to families with young children um, has really uh, lift, you know, just magnified the critical need for childcare for our workforce to be able to go to work. And also lastly, it's just sort of elevated the disproportionality of, of the need, right? Because uh, it's impacting primarily women uh, for women to go back into the workforce. So I would definitely add that to the picture as something positive um, and it's sort of a, you know, both a positive and, and a negative, but that's what I would add. Thank you. Those are all great reflections. And I, I certainly feel like anecdotally from my personal experience have seen this conversation happening more and more. But I think it's also just taken a larger stage in, in some ways, just as I think all of you outlined. And there was an, an article in The Atlantic that we're actually going to include in our newsletter this week uh, that started to hit on and talk about like, OK, how do we move from we're talking about this more to we're, we're acting more? Um, and I think that that's a lot of the conversation. Hopefully we can have a little bit today. I do want to start to get into cost and funding a little bit, because I think that when we talk about advocacy, that's so closely tied. Um, I'm curious if any of you could share with us your understanding of like the current cost of child care in Contra Costa County and availability. We've certainly heard that that's shifted, that there's maybe less availability, but are you feeling like that is the case here in Contra Costa? And then I'm curious to talk a little bit after that about funding availability, kind of what new funding has come down or, or where there's a lack of funding. But um, maybe, Monica, maybe we could start with you, knowing that you have some expertise in Head Start and early Head Start and the availability there, and then we'll jump to Ruth, talk a little bit more broadly. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it, we, so as I mentioned, we administer our Head Start and early Head Start programs, which are federal programs. And so it's on an uh, eligibility-based um, enrollment. And so for, for those accepted, and meet those requirements, there, there is no cost. And well, because of that, we have so many, um, so many applications and we have waiting lists. And so um, actually part of our Measure X funding um, will be allotted to that group of those who don't, who don't qualify for, for a Head Start, but are also in need of quality care. Um, and so in terms of, of that, um, that's where we're headed in terms of Measure X funding. We'll be going to folks who would not qualify for Hurley Head Start or Head Start traditionally, like are kind of right at that cusp. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, yes. So, right. So those who are who don't meet those eligibility requirements for the program, um, there's what we call a wait list, but they also cannot afford the, qual you know, private childcare or, or high quality care. And so where do they go? And we, ha we have options, of course, we have our alternative payment programs and um, other programs, subsidized programs. And so the, the new funding we're receiving is we wanna focus on, on that group of still experiencing need, but don't quite meet our programs requirements. Thanks, Monica. And, and I'm going to turn to Ruth here just because Ruth was such an advocate during the Measure X process itself um, and really, I think, helped us 
I was part of that group, helped us to push forward um, and making sure that early childhood wasn't forgotten about considering it was something that we talked about so initially um, and it's always been part of the Measure X conversation. So Ruth, do you wanna reflect on that a little bit or what your thoughts are on how some of that funds, those funds might be spent? Surely, and um, I, I just have to say before I dive into that, that there's never been enough childcare. So let me just answer the question. We don't have enough child care. Uh, this county has for years, for decades, at least since I've been a mom here, I've lived here, raised both my daughters. Uh, and, you know, it, we've never had, we've always been between, you know, at a shortage of like 48 to 53%. And um, so there's that. And, and that's on subsidized care, uh, which means those are the families that are have uh, the lowest income and that have the highest needs. So um, that remains. And with the pandemic, there was even more childcare slots that were lost. Um, you know, approximately 13,000 childcare slots were lost in, you know, again, for children zero to five. Um, and, and the wait lists continue to be over 5,000 children. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, Miss, there's a misperception about you know what we hear about childcare at the state level, you know, being funded and what is funded about childcare. Childcare is complicated. Um, <laughs> it's not like K twelve, you know, which is sort of one system, but childcare is really a collective of different services and funding streams. So it takes a lot to really advocate for childcare because people don't get it. It's hard enough for those of us who have been here. It's not like, and it, it's not really intuitive, right? It doesn't work like other systems or like the one that we would compare it to, which is K-12. So I think for Measure X, um, that's definitely something exciting that is happening. And as you mentioned Lindy and, and Monica, we were, after a lot of, you know, fearless advocacy, we were able to secure um, what is 4.5, close to 4.5 million, um, actually more than 5.5 million. Um, there were, I don't know if you want me to dive into what, what was funded, Lindy, but, um, Sure. I, I mean, I think that it can be helpful for us to just reiterate sure. that because we often hear that big number, right? And I think that yeah. often leads to like, okay, but well, what does that break down into? What is it? What is this money actually going to be used for? Yes. So specifically for childcare, and um, there were three areas that were part of the proposal uh, that a coalition of us. So I, I also want to add that there is an existing coalition um, in the county called the Early Learning Leadership Group and that is really focused on childcare specifically and it's the core of our organizations um, really provide service providers of childcare, um, First Five included, Employment and Human Services, Community Services Bureau, our resource and referral network and other providers. And so um, that group, you know, we presented to Metro X and among the areas, um, there were three that were funded and approved by the Board of Supervisors through Measure X funding. Um, $4 million ongoing allocation for childcare slots, uh, particularly focused on infant and toddler care, which you know has the greatest gap and is the most expensive model of care. Um, and so, uh, right now, and I, I maybe I'll, I'll let if Monica wants to. I don't want to step in your, in your on your shoes, Monica. But just broadly, if you want to give more detail. But as she mentioned, um, the the goal right now with those that 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 part of funding with the collect collaborative that we're working on is to focus it on the families that would make too much to ever make it into the eligibility. You know, because if you think of a zero to 100 scale, um, some families even decline a $1 raise increase because that will bump them off their eligibility, which is pretty ridiculous, right? Um, but fam some families are out on the waiting list and they probably would never make it. You know, they're the ones from like the 50 to 100 
part of the scale. So the group is really looking to focus on, on those families that would make too much uh, or that are not, or that would not be eligible period. You know, that would be like the working poor. And again, really focused on infant and toddler care because that's an area where even from the state budget, we're seeing that we fell short. You know, we, we there's a lot of expansion on three and four year olds and preschool but infant and toddler care continues to be an area that is underfunded. So the second uh, category, Measure X, is provider stipends. And, and that uh, what was approved was an ongoing allocation for $1.5 million. And here's the other piece about the complexity. Uh, we really made sure that through our advocacy and message, messaging efforts that we made the point that in order for a childcare slot to be filled, there needs, there's the premise is that there's actually teachers that will actually be able to <laughs> teach uh, and, and, and work with the children. So um, just really driving the point that you need to have uh, the workforce available uh, and ready to, to have a slot filled and, and, and you know, have the operating costs met. And those are the intricacies and the nuances that when you say a childcare slot, you know, are not really talked about. So the stipends were a piece to really uh, um, boost the um, low compensation and, and the, 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 you know, the really low wages that our workforce has and to give providers um, bonuses or, or stipends that will help them stay, stay in their positions. So we've seen a lot of people are moving in with the, with the expansion of TK and expansion of preschool. One of the fears talked about right now is, you know, the workforce moving upwards. And so we're losing workforce in infant toddler care, losing the workforce in the earlier years because they um, justifiably so are moving towards those jobs. Um, so that's what that stipend money is for. And the collaborative is working on defining a criteria. Um, right now, um, I think the last conversation was to also focus on infant and toddler care. And then the last but not least, um, Measure X funding uh, that was approved is services for children with disabilities, $450,000 annually um, ongoing. Um, you know, the Board of Supervisors has established that the county departments will be the ones responsible to monitor uh, Measure X funding that has been approved and disseminate the funding. So for early childhood, Employment and Human Services is the county department responsible for dissemination. For the services with children and disabilities, First Five is really excited because uh, our commission approved a match to the 450,000 of $200,000. So we are increasing the pie to $650,000, which is something that as First Five, we're trying to do more and more as our revenue is on decline. Um, we can really help grow the pie for, for really critical services. And so, First Five will be actually uh, is working with Employment and Human Services as we speak to um, be the conduit for the children with disabilities funding and you know blend it and put it back out into the community. Um, we're still sort of in the contracts logistics, but probably what I want to say is that we really wanted to lift the work that has happened in the county. Um, county Office of Education led a, 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 an effort a couple of years ago in developing blueprint um, and so we're looking to that really sort of outline recommendations for inclusivity so we are going to be taking that work that was done by many of us um, here in the county and using it to help guide along with community partners um, what we're going to be doing with the six hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for children with disabilities and I'll stop there I'm sorry I went really long trying to share airs airtime I think that was really informative though. Ruth. Thank you for that breakdown. I really appreciate it. And Bill put some questions in the chat just about access to information and, and where folks can, 
can learn a little bit more about some of the statistics that you shared. Um, but for those of you who are interested in Measure X, those meetings are still happening and, and there is a continued effort to try to get information out to folks in a way that makes it easy to digest where all that funding went. So I want you to know that that is an ongoing effort. So Ruth, having you here to explain it is actually really helpful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kundalis, I'm wondering if you can comment on what you've heard, because I know you interact with a lot of community providers in regards to cost and or the, the potential utilization of these stipends or the potential loss of workforce to the K-12 system and just sort of, or I should say, I guess, expanding system, um, but just sort of curious what you've been hearing and, and kind of what your reflections might be as it comes, as it relates to cost. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you Ruth for the process that you've gone through Measure X and everything it's great um, you know it's funding that we desperately need um, and what we've heard from staff they go from utilizing funds for gas for personal use all the way to classroom needs so it's a it's a big continuum and it for me, um, each person ind indicated individually, you know, what they've been using it for and what they use those stipends for. Some have used it for educational purposes to continue to have their education, for permits, for um, for their professional development, for um, even some college courses. So they've been utilizing that money um, the best to their ability and to what their need is. So um, another thing that we need to understand, I saw in the, in the chat that, yeah, ch it's more than childcare. So they're also looking at the educational component of um, what they're going to be doing with their children. And um, just um, bringing that to the attention too, like they'll spend some of their own money for their supplies on what they can have for the children. And so, um, yeah, we really need that. And um, sometimes some of our staff also don't have benefits. That's another thing they'll use it for benefits, um, you know, for basic needs. So that's another thing that we need to look at that um, um, I'm not sure, uh, I think it was Ruth, where you mentioned that it's being compared, we kind of compare it to the K-12 system but really it's not necessarily in a K-12 status. There's a lot more that goes on behind that. So thank you, Ruth, for bringing that to everyone's attention is that it is a lot of different funding streams. And then from those funding streams, sometimes um, the allocation is very specific. So you could only use it for certain materials. You could only use it for certain use, but at the same time, it's kind of like, how can we help um, better the you know just their their the cost of living really um and getting them to to a place where we can have um we can pay them what what they should be paid you know so um that's pretty much where we're at what i've been hearing that they've been using it from basic needs to cl classroom needs Thank you. Yeah, it seems like a broad, broad reaching, which in some ways is probably exactly the benefit, right? That that, that wasn't specific, that it gave folks a little bit of discretionary funding. Ruth, you unmuted. Was there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say to give just a little contrast that the the average cost for infant toddler care annually for a family is $19,460. Um, and for preschool, it's it's like fourteen thousand, you know, close to two hundred and eighty four, so close to fifteen thousand. And um, you know, we hear that families pay as much as eighteen percent of their total income for infant care. Um, so that's substantial considering the crisis that we're in and inflation and all of that. And um, and and about thirteen percent for infant toddler care. So just to add for contrast. Um, so just wanted to mention those two amounts. Oh, I, it's Nicole, I just wanted to add something to what you're saying about, you know, the income. And I, I have three kids actually, and thankfully they're out of daycare now, but I think that the lack of options and resources for daycare really drives that price up. 
in term, and also in terms of convenience. So unless you can afford to have someone drive and pick your children up and take them to the daycare, you end up paying for the on-site daycare and they charge a premium, which is unfortunate. Um, but also if, if you fall in that middle income range, you don't get the tax credits. I mean, you might get your child tax credit, but you don't get the, um, get the earned income. I don't know, I just did my taxes recently and I, I don't qualify for some of those, um, those credits anymore. Yeah. And not because my kids aren't in school, but just because of income, but it's pretty, it's a pretty low threshold, in my opinion, living in the Bay Area. It is. And that is a, an ongoing conversation as well, Nicole, you bring up a good point about earned income tax credits and how they might be better utilized and, and expanded. And it's certainly something this group could, could choose to take on as, as a potential advocacy item. Um, I'll definitely bring that up with our planning members, some of whom are here, um, as, an, as an issue to continue to explore. Certainly, there are a lot of coalitions that concentrate just on that, Nicole, just on thinking about like, how do we expand the early, I'm sorry, the earned income tax credit. And um, there's even folks in the guaranteed income world who are really interested in that um, and kind of take that approach. So. I do wanna just quickly, before we kind of transition out of cost and funding, um, to sort of ask the three of you your thoughts on state funding. We talked a lot about this new county funding in Measure X and some of how it might be utilized. Um, the article I referenced earlier did talk about how in Europe, there's been an expansion of sort of right to um, early childhood service and how in some ways that's been beneficial, but they've also found that now folks have a right to something there's not access to because there's not the workforce, right? And so that brings up the question as I, that I think all of you have been kind of hitting on around, do we concentrate on increasing slots? Do we concentrate on building the workforce? Can we do those things at the same time? Um, and it seems like the state is grappling with this exact question, right? They've certainly come under some criticism for spending a lot of time on increasing slots and not maybe as much time on building the workforce that might be needed to be able to actually satisfy the slots that they're building. Um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, and, you know, we could go as far as to say if you had a magic wand, how would you spend state budget dollars? Um, but I'm just sort of curious if, if there's any state dollars that you'd like to reflect on and kind of share with the group your thoughts there. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I could I could start with that. Um, I just read something. Um, <coughs> excuse me, from the joint legislative budget proposal, and it's while it's awesome that you know millions and dollars are going into California's childcare system. Um, I I just noticed there's not enough allotment into um, actual Head Start and early care and and you know learning more about the universal uh, child care, it just, it just boggles my mind to think, because um, we've experienced shortages for, for years. And so when you, I think in my, in my own thoughts, if um, you, you can't continue to open slots without first having the, the qualified uh, staff in place to provide those services you know, kind of tying it into what I mentioned earlier about, you know, um, well, as Dr. Ruth mentioned, there's not enough childcare and we, we have, uh, we can provide more services if we just had that staff in place. And so I think uh, more advocacy is needed in well, at a local state and federal level in terms of allocating those funds for salaries specifically. I, I would completely agree with Monica. I think that the, you know, while we do have, I, I would say really there's great leadership at the, at the state level. Um, I think that the areas where the state budget falls short, especially considering that we have a 97.5 billion surplus is around on, on addressing fair compensation for providers. Um, and so that leaves just, there's a lot of inequity across what providers are eligible for. There's monies in the budget right now for um, increasing benefits and, and working with the labor sector for family childcare providers, which is a great win. Um, I did wanna call out though, that we still have an opportunity for advocacy. Uh, the governor Newsom still needs to make a decision around the Affordable Childcare Family Fees Act. Uh, AB 92, 
Gomez Reyes. And um, I think that's going to him or, you know, sometime in August. And so, and, and I, I'm happy to share a, a fact sheet on it, uh, but basically it would waive family fees for families and it will ensure that for the lowest income families, um, the cost of childcare would not go over 1% of their family income. Um, and, and so it really just provides a lot more flexibility and expands the availability and access. So, um, and I, I really believe that that is the paradigm that we're in. You know, I know there's a lot of really smart, dedicated people, uh, both in advocacy and at the state level working to uh, roll out the funding that's going out. But the, the it's a balancing act. And so the there needs to be really thoughtful, you know, careful um, rollout because the zero to three, like um, sector, as I said earlier, is in jeopardy if we don't do it, you know, carefully in terms of seeing even a bigger exodus of uh, current zero to three providers into the higher paying jobs in preschool and TK. So there's sort of a lot of volatility and as we grapple with rolling out policies and balance the need for affordable access and preserving and retaining the workforce that we have right now. We haven't even talked about attracting new workforce, but um, at least retaining. Yeah, that's what I was going to add to it, attracting uh, staff, but how can we attract staff is making sure that we're compensating them to the level of work that they're doing. Also, like, like you mentioned, if I had a magic wand, really, um, making it uh, easier for these funding streams not to have so many restrictions to tie to that tied to them because some of them do so um, one program might have five different funding streams coming in to just help them run you know while within a school district it's just one funding stream well maybe one or two right but that also adds to the complication that also adds to the job that also adds to the stress so that's what our providers are you know, struggling with currently. So if there was a magic wand to help with that, you know, one of the biggest things also that I noticed when I would work with Head Start, it's um, the national um, income. It was, it was, it, it goes, since it's federally, it goes based on a national income guidelines, but in California, our, our income is extremely high and we still are, like Ruth said, the working poor, we can't afford and I can't get my child into a good program because I don't meet those income guidelines. So another thing that I would really like to do and see is for those income guidelines to be either completely erased or um, made appropriate per state um, because the, it really doesn't meet the need of our current state and our current um, individuals in our population. So that's another thing that I kept seeing and noticing. And that's why, I, Monica, it's great that you're using some of those funds to help some of those families be able to access um, that care. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are all helpful reflections. And, and I think using the word paradigm, Ruth, is, is a fitting one in that there's a lot to this and there's a lot of careful rollout that needs to be considered and thought about. Um, I do have a few questions that I wanted to kind of transition away from cost and funding, but I'm realizing that we're a whole group here and we've only got a few more minutes. So I do just want to take a quick moment and see if anyone wanted to raise their hand or had a you know kind of burning question that came up for them before I jump into a few more that we had kind of come up beforehand. Um, is there anyone who wants to kind of jump in? I appreciate those of you who put some comments in the chat too. Okay, awesome. Well, we've got a few more minutes. Feel free to raise your hand if you change your mind. Um, I, as an employer organization, right, I'm curious what thoughts you all might have on how you'd like to see employers engage in this way, or if there's any models of, of employers you've seen engaged in this way, um, or what you would like to see, again, if you maybe had a magic wand from employers um, or the business community broadly, but recognizing that employers is 
is public, it's private, it's nonprofit, right? Um, it's uh, sometimes a more broad term. And all of those employers are likely dealing with employees who are encountering this problem in one way or another. Um, so I'm sort of curious, like what your thoughts are in, in how employers can engage and maybe even potentially some models of the best ways employers have engaged, um, or if any of you have, have had thoughts on that. Um, Ruth, you were nodding your head, so I'm gonna start with you and then maybe you can pass it from there. I was really dying to get to this question. <laughs> Um, no, and I, I think we're very, I, I just really appreciate being part of this group. Um, so I have, yes, I have some very tangible thoughts about it. I think uh, starting just with um, employers being, continuing to be the best family friendly um, policy supporters in their own, um, in their own organization, in their own workplace. So I think uh, continuing just from an equity perspective, you know, employers have just continued opportunities to take incremental steps towards being more family friendly, thinking about equity implications for the families, uh, you know, or employees that have young children. Um, you know, not every employee needs or wants child care benefits, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I think having that as an option is something that we would want to, you know, aspire towards. Um, so, I think there's definitely a lot of models around um, employer sponsored childcare on site, um, childcare vouchers to their staff. And, and we've also mentioned a few even just this morning. Um, our state is actually possibly one of the most um, employee progressive, you know, state um, that has, you know, paid family leave. And um, so I, I think that just continuing to elevate education also for employees around our income tax credits and, and what's available to them now at this point in time. Um, I also, you know, I've been really excited about a couple of models. I wanna mention one, cause I know we have very limited time, but there's a group of business leaders and executives, philanthropy, community leaders in Colorado, Denver, Colorado called the, um, they're called Executives Partnering to Invest in Children. Uh, EPIC is the ac acronym. And they have been working together, um, again, recognizing that, you know, stable childcare, it's a win-win for society and the economy. So they have come together to do multiple things, which I think are examples of what employers can do and what an organization like East Bay Leadership could do. One is to rally around uh, collective um, advocacy on specific policies and legislation. Um, there are providers that uh, have issues with zoning. There's some infrastructure issues that are connected to even being able to build or have a business that provides childcare. So um, I think that employers have a very influential voice in that arena. Um, you know, the second one is this group that I mentioned, they they have a lot of examples of doing collective work and support to do needs assessments, feasibility study, studies, financial um, type of performa modeling um, or project management for childcare. I, you know, childcare programs, we just talked about the fact that they're incredibly underpaid and, you know, they don't have at their fingertips all of these resources to really sort of grow as a business and, and think creatively for the business aspect. So I think employers have a great opportunity to do that. So one nugget is that the Epic Group in Colorado, they created an 8.8 .8 million employer-based childcare um, grant program for employers that create on-site or near-site childcare facilities. Now our state is increasing childcare facilities that is a, that's another um, topic that is really complex because you know it's really hard to find and it takes a lot of money. But um, this is a really great um, example. And the other thing that they have done in Colorado is they have done their first of its kind kind of employer based design lab where employers who want to create solutions for their employees, uh, but they're not familiar with the industry, you know, I mentioned that you know it's they come together on a series of learning sessions where they talk about real estate 
governance, financing operations, and this design lab opportunity really, they come out of it understanding childcare and how it's run better and how they can contribute and be, you know, influencers for financing. So just wanted to mention those. Thank you, Ruth. I look forward to looking more into that. And that's definitely an interesting approach. I don't feel like we've heard talked about as much here, like grants to the employers themselves who are interested in partnering or are thinking about creating that kind of on-site um, care facility, particularly when there has been some creativity in that space. I immediately, of course, think, in, think of like Choice in Aging, who put Choice in, has Choice in Learning and kind of combined those. Um, but thinking of our larger employees where there's a large campus space, that having some funding to just convert a space might, you know, be a good forward step. So I appreciate that and look forward to learning a little bit more. Um, Dr. Green, Eliza or Monica, do either of you have any thoughts on what you'd like to see employers engage on? Um, Ruth covered a lot of great information. Um, yeah, on site, I think would be great because of, you know, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, you know, having to drive your child to daycare, having to pick them up, the fees attached to um, being late, you have to be on time or or you, you, you can't take your child out early because um, because there's a fee attached to it. So there's a lot of little nuances that go on that affect the families that um, I think employers should um, take into consideration. Um, you know, being a little bit more flexible with, with their staff, just, you know, training and technical assistance to um, kind of, I don't know what the right word would be, but be more compassionate towards working families and the fact that they, you know, have childcare needs and need to go uh, pick up their children. There's a, there's a lot of private companies who have um, on-site childcare. Um, one thing that Ruth brought up that um, that is difficult is facilities. Facilities um, aren't very, you can't like snap your fingers and the facility is up, especially if you need, um, there are certain restrictions, there's certain um, health and safety requirements that have to be met. Uh, licensing, um, you know, uh, fire marshals have to come and make sure everything is good you know so those are that's another thing that needs to be taken into consideration when we're um, talking about being able to give funding to employers and uh, um, and able to get these facilities and then the other thing are they going to have enough slots you know to to meet the need and the demand within their companies so that would be another thing that would need to be taken into consideration as well to see the amount of slots or are they going to partner with other uh, entities or other agencies within the community to help them you know, meet their needs. So how can we help each other and leverage those funding? Yeah, that, that kind of collaborative approach, thinking of themselves not, maybe not siloed, um, as one employer, but it's, you know, employers with maybe kind of similar need in a very similar area. And thank you for bringing up the infrastructure, Ruth and Dr. Lizzo. I think that that is something that we certainly heard um, and that there's been conversations about even here within the Eastern Leadership Council, like what does engagement look like? We actually just saw something the other day in an incorporated Contra Costa County where a childcare facility was being denied um, due to something that really, for the most part, had to do with parking, which is something we talk about a lot here when it relates to housing, right? We talk a lot about how housing is often denied because of parking issues, but it was a whole nother thing to see like, well, there's in, in an area where you have a lot of need, there's not going to be a child care facility because there wasn't the right amount of parking. Uh, Dr. Sheila Hassel-Hughes, please. Thanks. I, I was just going to respond with, you know, to say, uh, um, thinking about this from an employer perspective, we've had faculty and uh, especially, but also staff advocating for some kind of on-site child care at St. Mary's for many years. And we've done a couple of different, you know, the institutions done a couple of different feasibility studies um, and inevitably have determined it won't work for one reason or another. Um, there isn't actually enough demand, you know, to constitute a, um, a facility that would be able to serve the various ages needed. 
Um, and we are, although we have a lot of space, <laughs> we're very facilities challenged. Um, so one of the ideas that has been, you know, uh, bandied around is, is there a possibility to partner with um, local employers? Now, Morag is not the best place for that necessarily, right? But um, I think the need to really think outside the box and, um, and think about, you know, a combination of grants and partnership and, um, and just being creative is important because I know, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to hire and retain um, both faculty and staff and being able to provide quality childcare, um, access to it would be a huge bonus for us. So just some thoughts. Absolutely, thank you for sharing those. And it's good to just have an example, right? Where there is an interest, there is a desire, and yet it just hasn't quite been able to, to come together. Uh, Bill, why don't you conclude us with our questions today? There's the mute button. Uh, more kind of a, an idea to float, building on the, this issue of facilities. Uh, I wonder if there are new opportunities emerging of potential spaces that could become childcare facilities as we're seeing the workforce shift away from offices and a lot of these office spaces becoming empty. I know. They're in spaces where there were all the workforce was already going. Is there a synergy of converting half a dozen old conference rooms into a child care center in a facility where you have a bunch of employees working so that they then effectively have an on site child care or it's near other working uh, adults? But I don't know if you know a sort of a, off the top of the, the head. Uh, possibility, but that, that might be an, a thing for a facilities group to look into. Yeah. Or for cities to partner in, right? To have Absolutely, grants for the yeah. cities for them to to do some investigating in what might be possible to pull employers within their cities together in a space where there's commercial access. It's a, it's a great idea. Bill. Thank you. Right, okay. And it's, I would, real quick, if I could, I just add go right ahead. another group would be I know, looking at educational institutions like the community colleges and even the K-12 schools, as all of education is starting to rethink strategically long term, what percentage of our classes are going to be on site versus online? Mm -hmm. I know now that we've had two years of showing that a lot of education can happen effectively online and people are used to it now. You know, do we now have an overabundance of educational space that could become child care centers? Absolutely. The Concord campus for Cal CDs Bay is looking at their space right now, and it's a great suggestion to read forward to them. Have you considered what part of your facility might be able to be utilized in this way? I love it. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this will be recorded and we will be sharing it out. So I look forward to all of you hopefully sharing it with some of your colleagues who maybe weren't able to join us today. And I look forward to our planning group, hopefully having some further conversations about how we can build on what we learned today. So thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Karina. And thank you, Monica, for being our panelists. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and I just appreciate you bringing such concrete examples and things for us to, to concentrate on as we move forward. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Have a great day, everyone. Ready. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Lindsay and the EBLC for hosting this event, pulling it together. Absolutely. So happy to be here. Ditto to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.